Um, and so uh, we'll, uh, I, you're welcome to interrupt me with questions as we go. And so this is sort of a set of thoughts I've been putting together um, around uh, um, execution from data and how data ties in and sort of what we can do with it and sort of my evolution of that thinking. Um, and so for those that don't know me, I've, uh, I've been a distinguished engineer at Red Hat for years and years and years, um, worked on many, many product products, most recently had OpenShift and developer, and I've now taken on driving specifically around our data development and insights and strategy for, uh, uh, for Red Hat. Um, and so the, the journey started for me maybe six years ago. And what I would notice is that some teams would deliver more than others, or some companies would just fundamentally outperform other companies in the industry. And I started being curious and asking why. Um, and so when I, you know, I read everything I could find on the topic, and there's a lot of great reading. Um, and there's many things that talk about, okay, um, creating, you know, uh, great teams, great culture, great environment, psychological safety, um, making sure that you have functional teams. Um, and there's an enormous amount of fantastic um, uh, 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 information to actually create really, really healthy working org organizations in the community. And I came to the understanding that that is, you know, a fundamental that has to be in place. But it doesn't necessarily explain why all of a sudden you've got these some teams that are just break out. And so, until I found a study in Europe, and uh, one of the universities in Europe had been studying functional teams with the same question, and they started looking at when a team makes a decision, okay, um, is that a good or a bad decision, and what is the ratio of good to bad decisions? And a good decision was just defined as a decision which drives them towards the result that they were trying to get to okay so that was the only that's the, the only definition of a good and what they found is that teams on average were making 43 percent good decisions so just a little bit less than the coin toss <laughs> we think that's wrong but it's actually pretty accurate okay so then they thought, okay, obviously the teams that are performing better are the ones that are getting a higher ratio of good decisions. So they went and found that team, and the team the highest in the study was making 46% good decisions. So still less than a coin toss. But now comes the most amazing discovery. The teams that were making higher than average uh, statistical you know, in a, a, a good, you know, ratio of good decisions were the teams that were performing the worst. If I don't have your attention now, let me say that again. <laughs> the teams that were getting the higher number of good decisions, that ratio, were the teams that were performing the worst. Okay, so you've got to say, all right, this is crazy. What well, this is just stupid. It doesn't make sense. I pondered on this for a while. And I eventually thought, okay, I figured this out. All right. So this is, I think it's logical. And so this is what I came to. So in engineering, I was 60, 70, something that created this process called the waterfall process. Okay. And the waterfall is basically, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, you don't get a great result unless you go through the process. Uh, of getting great requirements. And so Waterfall started off by saying, you know, anything that's wrong with the output of something that's delivered in Waterfall is blamed that the input was wrong. Better requirements, better this, more analysis, et cetera. And so it's one big decision. We know with Waterfall projects that they often run over budget, are late, and don't deliver what the user wants. The fundamentals of one Waterfall project is you're literally flipping a coin <laughs> in terms of you're trying to get to that 46%, which is taking forever, but you still, your probability is still low. And so the industry invented this thing called Agile, where 
the individual fidelity of a single decision of a team on average is still only 43%. But with Agile, you're going through iterations quickly and you've got fundamentally this, the, the, the Agile is successful because of one thing, it's called iterations and a retrospective. And the retrospective essentially says, did what we do work? That's why you do the retrospective in full, small cycle. And if not, you adjust. So what you're doing is you're throwing out that 57% bad decisions and you're getting linear growth, okay? In engineering, you've heard this term many times, fail, uh, fail fast, fail often. Why do you think we say fail fast, fail often? Because statistically, we've got to identify at least 57% of decisions which were not great and eliminate them out of the process as quickly as we can. So we focus on the ones that give us the linear growth. All right, so at this point, all right, we've explained Agile, <laughs> we've explained the batting odds, we've understand why, we, but it doesn't explain why some teams still exponentially perform. It just explains why with good practices, people can get linear results. Where do those exponential results come from? So this is where I think, and this is sort of the organization I run, this is sort of the logo of, that we've made for it. Um, and I think this is where it's fundamentally is where you start bringing data into that process, okay? And so Agile, you've got to say that that retrospective is, you come to the fundamental conclusion that the retrospective is pooling common ignorance, or it's a coin toss, again. And so the way you change that is by, incorporating data into that retrospective or into that decision process. So essentially, I did something, does it show up in the data? Um, uh, did it show up in the way that I expected? If not, then I'm not driving the outcome that I'm looking for, make a new decision, take a new action, change, and go around this cycle iteratively, okay? But it's not just any data. Um, let me uh, let me break that down for you. So the best example, uh, okay, so let me, before I go there. Um, so hopefully I've got to the point where you say we've got to iterate, we've got to base it on data, and the goal is not to be right. Okay, the moment you try to be right, you're optimizing for 46%. <laughs> and you're psychologically getting the team polarized in terms of not creating a safe environment um, for, learning and failure. So the goal is never to be right. The goal is just to be less wrong on each iteration. Okay, so if I can look at the data and I can understand the data and I can make a decision that makes me less wrong, do it, <laughs> then do another iteration. And then how do I get less wrong and do another iteration? Okay, so what data? Now, um, this is an example you may not know about, uh, but when Tesla built the Model 3, they put the instrumentation system in first, and it's a you know premium vehicle, uh, but they noticed that the lumbar adjuster in the passenger seat does not get used, or basically does not get used. Now, if you were buying a premium vehicle, and they went and did a user survey or a Gartner report or whatever the equivalent is in the automotive industry. Everyone would have checked, you got to have lumbar adjuster, you got to have this, you got to have that, okay, because it's a premium vehicle. But it's not used, so they removed it, <laughs> saved the, the respect of cost, simplified the manufacturing and all the rest um, of that, and they put the dollar into something else where the users actually use it, okay. And so it's very important to actually look at tie yourself down to that usage data and not a proxy of it as you go through this thought process um, and evaluation. And so um, one of us showing some data to someone internally inside Red Hat and one of our uh, sales vice presidents, he made a comment which I like. He says, uh, the usage data is the truth and the truth is what happens. Um, and so it's, you know, if you understand what the user is actually doing, then that's what the user's doing is basically what it says. It's not what you think the user's doing um, um, from a deployment perspective. All right. So at this point, hopefully we at, we've got to iterate. 
we've got to iterate from data. Usage data is an important metric. But now the question comes, if we got to iterate, how many times do we need to iterate to get to greatness? Okay. Is it a thousand times? Is it five times? Is it a hundred times? If I want to achieve something, what does research tell me? How many times I need to iterate to get there? Does anyone know? Infinite? Any other, any other comments? All right. So this is a great TED talk by Mark Rober. Okay. Um, he builds a whole bunch of cool things where he throws darts at a dartboard and uh, the dart always gets a bullseye or never gets a bullseye depending who's standing in front of it. And he does a whole bunch of cool things um, in, the, in this TED talk. Um, but, uh, and he also talks about how to trick your brain into doing more iterations, which are some great techniques in terms of um, personal development. But he breaks up two concepts which are fundamental. Um, which actually stand up in other research, but he illustrates them best. The first is, if I get my mouse back, it, most people give up after six or seven iterations. Okay. And greatness comes between 15 and 17 iterations. Okay. So now, if I want to achieve something, the next logical question, obviously, or to me is, all right, I always want to achieve something great. So if I want to achieve something great, how do I iterate to that point in a meaningful amount of time? All right, so if my iteration is a year, in 18 years time, is that, is that still meaningful? If my iteration is a month, then it's a year and a half before I'm gonna get greatness. Um, if my iteration is a week, um, then yeah, maybe what am I doing? Half a year or something? Or what is it? Uh, someone can work that out. If I want to achieve something this month, then I literally have to iterate daily. Um, Carl, uh, I know, you, I know you wanted this to be a little bit conversational. Um, so one of the practices that we have on our team that we've fallen into is if we have a problem that we really need to solve and solve it soon, we do this thing where we meet every day. And we and it's like a little working group. We kind of put them together, meet, 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 and then solve it and then disband. Um, yeah. And I actually think that th that, is, that is basically what I hear you saying. And I think this is one of the reasons why this has worked so well for our team on any given kind of tactical problem. Sorry, just wanted to connect that. Yeah, that's great. And then the question is, can you can you can you tie that to the user data, and can you actually say, am I seeing the result I'm looking for in the user data, in the iteration to actually know whether I'm going in the right that right direction or not? If you do that, you you're sort of tying all the concepts of DEI and the learning and the learning together. Oh, I mean, many services companies, the reason why a lot of them outperform you know, in the market today is not because it's managed versus non-managed. I, I don't think that's the fundamental difference. The fundamental difference is they have the understanding of the user's behavior and they iterate aggressively based on what the user is doing with that understanding. And so the companies that take that approach, I think that's some of that's why you see the acceleration in some of those models, because they've got all those fundamentals in place to be able to drive the iterations. Um, those that grasp onto it, those that don't, I think just peter out and disappear. All right, so shall I give you one more, another question, one more example, and then I'll stop. Sounds good, Carl. Right. Okay, so I wanted to give you an example on a global, not a global, but on a massive scale. Okay. And so anybody, uh, you know, when, when I was a kid, I watched some of the space shuttle launches and it was awe inspiring. And uh, I sort of got into it and have sort of tracked what's been going on over the years in the industry. And so 
when NASA stopped flying the space shuttle, um, they started a program called Artemis. And the intent of Artemis was to return the launch program of the US of NASA um, to space. And the Artemis program basically said, we're going to reuse all the technology in the space shuttle. We're going to use the, use the same engines that were on the back of the space shuttle. But instead of having three, we're going to have four. We're going to attach them to the fuel tank that the space shuttle used to fly. But we're going to put an adapter on top of it for a single use second phase to go to orbit. And we're going to take the two side boosters that the space shuttle used to use. And we're going to extend them by 25% and slap them on the side. And that's going to be the replacement for the space shuttle, the space shuttle launch vehicle. And so this program was called Artemis. Now, uh, this is a picture of the first stacked Artemis rocket. It has not test launched yet. Maybe next year it gets its first test launch. It will probably be operational in 2024. Uh, to date, it's been 17 years since this program has been in effect and they've been working on it. This is their first integrated iteration um, to do tests on. And they have spent $19 billion to get to this point. And by the time it uh, becomes operational in 2024, they probably, the estimate is they would have spent $21 billion to do that. Okay, so that's my example number one. Okay. Example number two is in South Texas in a little town called Brownsville, where no one knew where it was on the map two years ago. Uh, SpaceX decided to evolve their launch capacity and mission uh, from Falcon 9, which really does 80% of the capacity into space. And it was a blank piece of, piece of Earth um, about two years ago. And from this location, their objective was to build a fully reusable rocket, two stages, with vertical landing for crew and payload, with twice the launch lift capacity of the Saturn V, so it's the largest rocket that's ever been built in the world in terms of uh, lift capacity. Um, and they planned for 20 iterations to figure out how to build, launch, land, and create all the systems for the second phase of this rocket. And so this is a photo a couple months after they started. You can see they've got a tent, and they're doing a few things there down in South Texas. Now. On the 15th iteration, what they did is this is uh, SN15, so it's the 15th iteration. They launched it up to, I believe, a mile, shut off all the engines, uh, let it free fall down again, uh, relit the engines, and did a controlled landing. And they stuck the landing. Every single iteration up to this point either exploded, or blew up or something <laughs> went wrong on it. But now what's more incredible is by the time they got to iteration 15, okay, how long do you think it took them to do 15 iterations of a rocket? That's, this rocket is 80 meters tall, weighs 85 tons. Um, it's brand new rocket engines that they've designed. It's a fuel that's never been flown before from a rocket. It's an aero concept that's never been done before. Um, they've got to weld it, manufacture it, do the computer systems, get the telemetry. They've got to cryo test it, static fire it, fuel it, get FAA approval, and then fly it. Then it crashes, and then they go around another cycle to the next iteration. How long do you think the iteration cycle was? They were iterating in three weeks towards the end of this process. They did eight, they did uh, 15 iterations in eight months. The first iterations were longer. And by the time they got to this version, they were running an iteration every three weeks. A new physical rocket every three weeks? Yep, a new physical rocket. If you go on the internet, they, a new physical rocket, they launched a new rocket every three weeks towards the end of the cycle. With design changes, manufacturing changes, when you look at the rockets, do they actually look different from from cycle to cycle to cycle? Wow, Carl. Um, 
uh, man, this has been great to see. Um, again, can and a couple minutes left. We only have a few minutes left. Can we talk? Can you share a little bit about the um, how the data um, has been collected and what problems you were trying to solve as you applied these this thinking to the OpenShift project? Sure. So yeah, so I'll stop here. Uh, I'll leave this up because he's sort of. I think this is worth leaving up while we talk to that question. Maybe I come back to a few pieces. So. When you start thinking this way, uh, a lot of what you do, you land up questioning. And so my journey with the OpenShift team and you know, and some of the change we started making is saying, okay, when you release a product, the most the cost of actually servicing the product after it's released is six times that of actually building it. So your support cost, your patching it, your, you know. If you look from a usually five, sorry, lost my mind, five or six times um, that of actually building it. So the engineering cost is actually very, very small. So when we make a release, you know, everything in a traditional software development cycle like QE and release manager, it's all about managing the risk of the downside of giving someone software. <laughs> because then because then um, you know you, you deal with all the maintenance and gets harder and that type of thing. But they say, you know, unless your failure path is your common path, you've got a problem. And so in OpenShift, I tried to make everything that was a failure path the common path. So for example, they say, if you never do a DR test, you don't have a DR strategy, because if you never actually flip your data centers in a disaster recovery test, when you want to do it, it's never going to work. And so the concept is keep flipping them every week. And you know, when you when you need to DR, it's not a big deal because it's a procedure. It's something that is part of the way the business operates. Um, you know, it's like some of the fundamentals of Kubernetes. It's you know, transient. You know, uh, uh, deal with failures or design for the failure. Don't design as that exception. Okay, so if you think about releases, we said okay, um, let's release everything every week on a Thursday, and call that fast. Let's release everything that we create every night at the nightly systems and call that nightly. And let's release something when we move something from fast to something called stable is when we believe it's in good condition. So now the risk of releasing is not there because we've designated what people should expect from those different release streams. But now we can look at all the users from a telemetry perspective that are running fast and we can say, is the software behaving in a way that is acceptable for us to move it to stable? So we're not guessing about that decision. <laughs> it's just being made based on a data point. And if you release and it doesn't meet the criteria, you go fix it. It's that 57%. And you iterate until it meets the criteria um, from the data, which is coming back from a telemetry perspective. And then you move it to stable. And so when you cross over into the thinking of data informed execution, you, you, you can sort of relay out a lot of what you, a lot of the, you know, it's like moving from waterfall, waterfall to agile, a whole bunch of stuff to do in waterfalls irrelevant in agile. Uh, when you move from, when you add data informed execution on top of agile, a whole bunch of things that we think were revered practices are, they don't make sense anymore um, in the new world. Um, Carl, just to connect that with something that Pulp does, um, we uh, when we release new features, we tend to mark them as this thing called tech preview, which is common in a lot of software projects. Um, it kind of excludes them I mean, in a literal sense that it excludes them from the semantic versioning uh, commitment, which kind of gives us the flexibility to change that API, for example, um, as we learn that it's maybe not a great fit or has a problem here or there or whatever. So we use tech preview. And I think we have a really difficult time understanding when a feature should be called um, stable enough to remove tech preview. Um, and uh, I don't know how to say it any more plainly than we basically guess. Yeah. Um, and uh, so when I think about data driven execution and the problems that Pulp has, um, uh, we kind of do it in, a, in almost like a feature by feature basis. And we just lack the data. We have no data collection, really. Well, we have some. We have anecdotal collection, um, but that's not the same thing. Yeah. So with 
so with with OpenShift, what we did is so we instrument and it sends instrumentation back every five minutes. Um, and the instrumentation of what gets sent is an open Git Git file, you know, Git GitLab file, so anybody can see it and not be concerned that we're sending anything confidential or business or whatever. It's purely for the benefit of the you know of the the software, yeah, you know, versus doing anything creepy because everyone can just go and have a look at what's coming back. Um, and we roll that up into count into counters, uh, push that back into uh, you know, an observatorium, which is essentially a, a Prometheus, Grafana, Thanos um, backend. Uh, and then on top of that, we essentially build analytics. So, for example, you know, uh, when we have a feature or an operator, when it you know it gives a metric of you know if the, yeah, if something is firing an error or an alert, or those things are collected and sent back in a time sequence. And so it gives us the ability to know, you know, did it upgrade? Did it upgrade successfully? Is there a fault firing in the upgrade? Um, uh, we've been able to see when you release something, if we have an issue in the fleet, and to, you know, talk about it as the fleet and saying the following, um, uh, we see the following trend occurring. And if we see any problem in the fleet, we try and find it, fix it, and issue a patch back out, which then corrects that behavior in the data before it gets to over 3% of the fleet. Um, so if we see something, <laughs> essentially now you can be proactive and say, you know, can we correct that defect before it has a rolling impact um, across the fleet? Uh, and so the, 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 you know, the way, essentially the way of thinking about that of saying, you know, one moving it from tech preview to a feature is, am I getting enough signal back from that that I determine it's you know good enough? Uh, but then the other problem is on every single release there's risk, and it's not just is this feature good? I don't know what it's doing. If I'm instrumented, then the question comes: Is there anything happening out there in the world <laughs> um, which is starting to cause an issue, and can I can I get on top of it? And resolve it before it becomes a major problem for uh, my user base. Um, thank you for sharing those details. Actually, I didn't hear those exact details when I had talked with you previously, so that's great. Um, I would like to, after um, we talk here about OpenShift, share an example or two from a different community that I'm part of called the Home Assistant Community, um, which I have to bring up every PulpCon because I love Home Assistant. But, um, before we get to that, um, one, one, maybe the last question, Carl, that I wanted to ask um, is, you know, trust and, and privacy are incredibly important in the relationship with our users. Like trust, I think, is the foundation really for their usage of our software, especially when they tie their businesses up in it um, and their time in it. So how did OpenShift navigate maintaining trust with its user base as it added you know, this, for example, five minute reporting and telemetry, um, I mean, phone home, let's just call it, let's just call it what it is. Um, how did you navigate trust with your users as you added that capability? Yeah, I mean, obviously the whole capability is open source and public and we made the get really, really easy. Um, and every single thing that goes in is debated uh, and is well documented publicly so people can see, you know, you know uh, uh, what it is. And we were also very careful to send a, you know, a very small set of information, but a set that's very impactful for us to actually understand what's happening in terms of you know, being able to start driving data-informed execution. And then I flew around the world and talked about it, 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 talked about it some more, talked about it, talked about it, talked about it some more, <laughs> made a fool of myself in in large meetings of you know thousands of people in Europe and you know I've just uh, <laughs> talked about it some more <laughs> um, and then we do uh, we do also allow people to be able to turn it off um, but you know most most people actually just so there are some scenarios for example in some deployments where they they can't turn it on for regulatory reasons or things like that and then they turn it off but what happens is for the small percentage um, that do turn it off, 
they still get the benefits from everybody else from the fleet because if we see something in the fleet we fix it and they still get the fixes um and so the common good for those that can't have it on still flows through um but it's a pretty small percentage of people that actually turn it off so it's not a um but yeah it's a, and i still talk about it uh, probably a lot um well thank you for sharing everything here um today uh i was hoping to i really appreciate it um, I was hoping to share an example or two from the home assistant community, um, uh, if I may. And also, um, I did want to point out that I believe this is also a practice that Fedora does. Um, Fedora has a crash report um, on yeah. by default uh, system, which has the same motivations um, uh, and concerns around privacy and trust. But the idea there is that when updates roll out on Fedora, and it creates problems, uh, those crash reports go back to the packagers who package that software, which is, um, I think, significantly reduces the time to fix for right. resolving those problems. So Fedora does this as well. A crash report's a little different in that it's uh, something went wrong, you know, and it sends a, a much larger set of information. As with this approach is it's a lot smaller information, which is time sequenced <laughs> or time series data. Um, which then actually allows you to run, essentially do data manage, management and data informed execution. So Fedora allows them to to respond to an issue that went out. Um, this essentially allows you to say um, how you know. This essentially allows you to use the data to drive iterative development and iterative engineering processes and data informed engineering processes. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit different, but it's the same the same concepts in terms of privacy management, community communication, um, etc. I appreciate that um, distinction. Uh, that's that's good for me to think about. I kind of put them together, so that's uh, helpful. Um, Carl, you're very much welcome to to stick around. I wanted to see if anybody has any more, any questions specifically for Carl. That way, in the event that you aren't here, uh, we can be sure to ask them. Uh, yeah. Hi, Carl. Thanks for sharing. Um, so my question is about this key uh, data which you collect. So uh, did you need to go through many iterations to identify what the key things are? Or do you have certain strategy to collect um, to keep it, this set minimal? Yeah, yeah. I think we started off just with counters, and Kate and Coleman was sort of the yes, no, it goes in initially, and there were a bunch of iterations just so that you know there was some person, I think, uh, making the the decision on that. Um, and uh, yes, um, we constantly find things that were wrong or needed to be changed or needed to be updated or needed to be fixed, and so. Um, uh you know i would yeah uh the the it started off with a concept of counters and and uh failure so initially we would just count if an operator come out and start issuing errors we would just count them and keep sending them then we realized that we want to know when the state stops. And so we actually started sending like some of the abbreviated codes. Um, and so it was a learning journey. And this is uh, partly why I wanted to show the Home Assistant as a different project, because they're very clear in terms of three types of collection metrics that they that they have as well. Um, but that, thank you for that. Um, Tang, did that answer your question adequately? And I see, thank you. Um, I see Ina's hand is raised, Ina. Um, hey, Carl, thank you for the presentation. A lot of interesting stuff to reflect on. Um, what caught my attention is this uh, uh, greatness, which comes between 15 and 17 iteration. And so I'm primarily interested, like, what sort of formula was used to do this sort of calculations? Uh, what was the criteria? Was it taken into account, I don't know, variables which are changing around? like? is this applicable basically to i don't know open shift only or we can say that most of the stuff works 
this way and the greatness comes in between these iterations like is it applicable everywhere or there are some specifics i think it's so i found the i found their research on the you know on the 15 to 17 iterations i found that research that research is not red hat research that is research i found elsewhere and so mark Rober uh, has got a large amount of references to that research. And then there's a whole bunch. If, when you start Googling it and you know about it, you'll find it everywhere. Now, the interesting thing is, um, I think if you're doing pure research, then that 15 to 17, I don't think, holes i think it's a lot higher so if you look at like edison trying to invent the light bulb he did 2000 iterations i believe um <laughs> and so if you look at some of the greats from a, from a research and technology breakthrough perspective uh, in the research field the iteration count is ridiculously higher than 15 to 17. um when you look from an engineering or from a uh, uh, manufacturing or uh, around uh, the evolution of decision and social process, the 15 to, 7 is, 15 to 17 is pretty good. Um, SpaceX does a, I don't know whether they're just conservative, they do, they plan for 20 iterations on everything. Um, they usually nail it around iteration 15. So I don't know whether that's just saying we're giving ourselves a buffer to force ourselves aggressively on timeline, um, but they, they work on a 20 iteration cycle um but yes it's generally it, it's generally applicable unless you're doing pure research thank you um all right one uh one last call for questions um or discussion from uh, carl's content okay i have a quick one if no one goes okay. uh <laughs> thank you uh have you seen like and you noticed any drawbacks or uh, overused of this approach or unsuccessful use of this approach or it's been all happy path and story so far um it's a great question it's a really good question so i think if you want to deliver exponential results with what I can find in research today, these are probably some of the leading thoughts and understanding from combining data and execution that I can find. Um, but in the same way that waterfall was the best thing in the world and then agile came along, um, you know, that informed execution, I believe is, is the evolution beyond agile. Um, in 10 years time or 15 years time, I'm sure someone will innovate beyond this. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so, thank yeah, you. And there is innovation happening. I mean, there's a rabbit hole. So there's something I'm called, there's a, there's a whole bunch of work happening on DOA, distributed autonomous organizations. I don't, and, but that's a rabbit hole. And I'd happily talk to the group about that if you want to. But that, that's where I think some of the next innovations are going to come from. But that's that's more in the research category than it is in the I can tell you it works category. <laughs> Carl, thank you so much for your time. I definitely invite you to stay for the remaining. Um, I think we only have nine minutes because I we absolutely have to um, have a five minute break before our session at eleven. So um, you're welcome to stick around. Really appreciate you being here, Carl. I, I appreciate uh, you sharing what you've shared with this group today. That's a pleasure. Um, Thank you. Yeah, can you share the slides too? Uh, sure. I will just need to. Uh, I, I just need to make sure there aren't others in here which are Red Hat specific, and then I'll share them. Yeah. Up. Perfect. Awesome. Thank um, you. I, I can help you coordinate that, Carl. If that's um, Thank you. whenever you have some content, just send it to me or to Melanie. Um, all right. Uh, what I'm going to do. Thanks, Carl. Um, I'm going to share my screen here along with a few links uh, to what I'm going to be showing. Uh, let's see if I can manage to figure this out. Um, okay, so um, I really, can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Perfect. Indeed. Uh, perfect. So here's a few links uh, that I'm going to just be talking over. Um, I just want to keep this um, very short, maybe just two or three minutes. But um, Home Assistant is a home automation project. It's free and open source. Um, and it's a project that I use personally and I really like. Um, a while ago, actually in April of 2021, they enabled um, analytics, which were on by default. And um, the way these analytics work, if you look here in the data collection area, is um, it collects when enabled data is sent every 15 minutes after each start and every 24 hours after startup. And they break down what they collect into basic analytics. You can read on this page more clearly about what that is. Um, usage analytics. Uh, and then general statistics, and I believe diagnostics, um, which was more like crash reports and stuff. So um, they have a little bit of information about how they collect their stuff. I'm not going to get into any of that, um, except to say that their stuff is free and open source. So I think it would be easy to re reapply it um, to pulp. And uh, they generate a system UUID, which is um, the not personally identifiable um, root of all reports that come in. And so you can read here more about what they collect, but um, part of their transparency goal is that all collected data is available um, publicly. There's no you know, creepy stuff happening behind the scenes. So you can see here that they break down their active installation by type, um, which is, really helps them prioritize their, um, you know, how they roll out their, you know, the different OSs that they're used on. This is just kind of like OSs, like whether containers or, um, you know, in a VM or some things like that. Um, also their versions, so they can look at their upgrade um, and uptake and usage, which I think is significant for them. Um, these are actually their um, OSs here and the releases, et cetera, et cetera. Location, I don't think this is quite as important for us, but, um, but oops. But what is very important, um, uh, you know, they have some just general statistics, but this I find very interesting. So Home Assistant is very highly plugin based, so is Bolt. And they talk about the percentage of um, installations that use a particular plugin. And this really, I believe, helps sort their developer priority about how significant and serious is a particular issue. So um, you guys can poke around through this. Uh, Last thing I wanted to share is um, here's a link to their announcement of it. Um, Home Assistant takes privacy extremely seriously. Um, in fact, the entire project is built to compete against um, uh, kind of big company solutions like things like Google Home and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, it's almost ironic that they would feel comfortable turning on um, telemetry and analytics. Uh, so um, you can read a little bit about how they've explained this. Um, it does, uh, they talk a little bit about why, um, and it is on by default and easily and clearly stated and um, easily able to be turned off. So um, it's just another community that I think is doing something. When I heard Carl's talk and I re remembered what I had seen from Home Assistant, it seemed um, like a direct connection. Um, and then what I was hoping to do in maybe a minute or two um, is identify some of the specific things that Pulp has challenges with. Um, just a few, like, what could we possibly use this for? So these are some areas that we've really struggled in our decisions due to a lack of data. Um, and, you know, one of them is this uh, tech preview thing, like, like alternate content sources. I think it's listed as tech preview. I have no idea how many people are using it. Um, when is it really safe? When is it safe to ship in a product? I really have no idea. Um, or, you know, I'd look at our database versions, you know, say that at some point we want to raise the Postgres minimum database version due to there being a significant performance benefit, um, like non-trivial, um, you know, if 30% of our user base is on the version that's going to get dropped, that's a major problem. If the number's more like 3%, that's much less of a problem, 27% less, actually. Um, so, you know, or things like, 
um, you know, like which plugins are used and just yeah. knowing, just knowing which plugins are, um, are in use, I think is, is significant. Um, I also wrote a few more down here. Oh yeah, the breakdown between Catel versus non Catel installs um, or Galaxy and G-based installs where Galaxy and G is present. You know, if 80% of pulp installs are really Catello installs, for example, then we should be probably prioritizing 80% of our effort towards their needs in, all, in an almost exclusive way. Um, and maybe that's, there's definitely an argument to be made on whether that's a good idea or not, but at least knowing the numbers will, will help us understand where we're at. Um, or the single container usage, like we talk about the single container and is it production ready? You know, if there are 10 people using it, 100 people, 1,000 people using it, I think that's a very significant data point around whether um, uh, whether we're uh, it's ready for production use or not. Just reading the comments here, Neil. Um, Neil, uh, come come join the conversation. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, unfortunately. This is designed to share a perspective, not in any way um, create a decision. But um, do you have some thoughts to share, Neil? Well, um, you know, you you said a uh, thing uh, about like if eighty percent of the deployments are with Catello. Uh, to me, that also might say perhaps we're doing a terrible job or not a good enough job advertising pulp as an independent project that people can use outside of the Foreman Catello framework. Like you can't necessarily derive the insight that you should be, you know, that it's happening because uh, with these things that this is necessarily the positive or negative outcome, or this is the, the way people actually want it to be. All it tells you is how things are. It doesn't tell you why or how or any of those other things. So, I, that it's important that when you're gathering data like that, that you also note that that doesn't correlation doesn't imply causation and doesn't imply necessarily, you know, how people actually want it to be. And, well and to said. that point, yeah, very well said. Um, and to that point, like we we already know that a lot of users who use Pulp only um, and don't use Catello still use the Catello RPMs. Yes, that's also true. I think that was kind of one of Carl's points, though, is that if you, even if you were to give a user survey to those people in the car manufacturers saying, like, what should be in a luxury car, and they check all the boxes, the user data shows that they don't use all those features. So it's kind of like a catch-22, where it's like, yeah, the, the data shows that they don't use this stuff, but then the users still want it, and then you think they might still need it because it's not present. Um, so I think it's still a, a tough, tough decision uh, where exactly we are because we are part of so many other projects. I, I agree. Um, so hopefully this has stimulated some thinking. Um, I hope to talk more about this later. I don't have a specific timeline for any of this. I happened to just see Carl's talk last week. Um, it really got me thinking. I wanted to bring that here. Um, the one last example I did want to share is when do we drop EL7 support? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer without understanding, you know, if it's say 30%, uh, for example, again, like 30%, we definitely couldn't drop it, I would feel like. And right now we just don't know. But in the event that it is 30%, what we could do is really try to have an upgrade campaign from, for example, EL7 to EL8, watch those numbers drop, 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 and then let the data help tell us when the time is right. Um, so, and yes, all right, Pulp 3 uh, does ship on EL7. Pulp 3 does ship on EL7, and there are no plans to drop it. This is an example of a decision that we went through with the L6 and really struggled with. Um, so thank you for the time and all the extra time I've taken, Melanie. Yeah, with EL6, we basically just made, I guess, that it was a I guess, guess which is what we're going to do. <laughs> it, 